Welcome back, everyone, to our Fiduciary Fitness Podcast. This is Colin Clarks, and I'm really pleased to welcome back uh, Megan Fielding of Tia Nuveen, and she's the Senior Director of Responsible Investing at Nuveen. And uh, Megan, uh, thanks so much for uh, for joining us again. Kind of ended last segment on how do we really figure out what, what a real ESG or environmental uh, social uh, governance type fund you know, what, what's the real deal and what's not? And, and so I wanted to kind of segue into uh, how are you seeing these funds show up in a defined contribution uh, plans like 401ks and 403b. So Megan, welcome back. Well, thanks for having me. It's great to be here with you and your, your audience. Now, so now, your question, yeah. Well, no, I, actually my question is around scheme. Okay, so I hear you like a big <laughs> ski buff. Okay. And, and uh, I always have to give a personal touch to these podcasts. So uh, you live in San Francisco. All right. We won't give your address or anything like that. Right. But, you know, you spend a lot of time skiing. And so I, I lived in Denver uh, when I was younger and I did ski. Uh, my favorite mountain is, uh, is a basin. So Arapahoe Basin. I love skiing that mountain. But you have a different place that you love. I do. I do. I, I, I go to Beaver Creek year after year. I, I think I've just past my 16th year there so oh my gosh so that that's a beautiful so Vail Beaver Creek I've skied the back bowls there what's your favorite I mean do you have a favorite run oh, I you know they're all favorite I mean you know any any day on the slopes is, is better than a day in the office they say right um I don't know what's my favorite run I love President Ford's run um it okay. starts you know that's pretty steep black and sometimes it's groomed, sometimes it's not. And then goes into a nice, you know, blue and then kind of comes down. But um, that's a beautiful, beautiful vistas. Yeah. Have you ever been in a, in a skiing movie? <laughs> <laughs> do, do we do we uh include the um the gopro <laughs> movie <laughs> yeah the, yeah there you go you post your gopros yeah. on youtube we can go watch you uh you know, you said you almost got run over by someone that, you know, looked like me the other day. So it wasn't me. I'm no, not no. That good. no, no. He, he was wearing a GoPro, <laughs> though. And, and the only, as he came over to help me up, I said, please turn that off. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, the good thing about skiing is it's in nature and we're talking about uh, environmental things. Right. So. Uh, so, yeah. So we were talking last last a segment on, you know, defining ESG, you know, what's it all about? Now we really want to kind of drill down and say, okay, I'm a plan sponsor. I'm listening to this podcast and I have employees coming to me all the time. And I get this when I'm doing one-on-one meetings with our, uh, our clients, employees. And so wh- where are you seeing these funds? How are plan sponsors using them? It's a good question. Um, you know, we see, I would say one of two ways. Um, one where it's a, an option within the menu um, and it's typically for an ESG fund, you know, I, I can't necessarily say I see more fixed income versus equity versus balanced, but, but it's, it's dedicated ESG choice. And then the other ways we see, you know, within the QDIA, so where, where they they have the opportunity to put something in, you know, That's an acronym. That you have to define the acronym. <laughs> okay. Uh, what? Yeah, so, that's, I know you have a $5. Qualified Default um, Investment Alternative, QDIA, right? Thank you. Qualified, so, yes. So you're seeing them uh, as individual asset classes in QDIA. Do you, do you, I'm seeing them as overlaying on top of the already existing active or passive funds. Uh, are you seeing the same thing or are you seeing them as single, like taking care of one asset class in an entire plan? Generally, it's it's one asset class from what I've seen. Okay. But you have a, a wider array, I would say, of, of clients that you're working with. And, you know, sitting in the position that you have, you know, oftentimes you're ahead of where I would be brought in, right? So you're trying to, I think, help clients go, you know, as we say, where the puck is going, whereas oftentimes I'm brought into an existing client situation, which might be reflective of a decision from years ago. Oh, so how would you interact in a situation like that? That's a very interesting. Yeah, usually it's to talk about what the fund is doing, what, what its purpose is, what are some of the investments, you know, what are the questions that the investors themselves really have on their mind? Oftentimes they want to hear about, you know, what's new, you know, so in the last year, the S in ESG, the social component is really one of the largest topics that people 
want to hear about, you know, how, how did COVID affect these businesses um, for better or for worse? Um, that does dovetail into the governance side, you know, more around diversity and inclusion, but that's both a social and a governance uh, topic, I would say. And then, you know, here, you know, we've just passed Earth Day. And so, you know, this week has really stimulated a lot of questions around the environment and climate change. And how is that affecting the companies that we're investing in? Um, I just received a question from a consultant on behalf of a few investors asking about, you know, what will we be doing or how is research taking shape now, recognizing climate change and climate risks? You know, are we shifting our exposure in any way, for example? So, so I'm thinking then, again, putting my advisor fiduciary hat on. So if I'm working with, uh, you know, retirement plan committee and we're considering putting in these types of funds, it would really behoove us to do our due diligence and, and bring in someone like yourself to really drill down uh, as we're considering maybe a, a narrow group of funds that we've put through our investment funnel. Is that fair? Absolutely. Absolutely. And and what might take place prior to that to precede it might be, you know, a, a due diligence RFP questionnaire that you send out, you know, to help narrow down that universe of managers or options that you're looking at or, or might consider. Oh, is that a resource that you can make available? We can show you, we can help you um, with some best practices that we've observed because we're the recipients of those questionnaires. Gotcha. Right? So, okay. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it's almost like a template, like the things that people should be thinking about when they're considering using funds like this. Absolutely. I would underscore that that it's really no different because, you know, from an ESG perspective, we're talking about the case from an investment lens, right? We believe in ESG because it makes good investment sense. And so it, the pursuit for ESG options in some ways is no different than the pursuit for a large cap value manager, right? It's all things are equal. You want the best manager who is, you know, delivering upon the investment um, objectives that they're, they've been hired to fulfill and they're authentic and transparent. And um, again, you know, it's the investment case. And you're, you're, the investors are getting paid for the risk that they're taking on as well. So, yeah, because I think the, the point I was trying to make earlier is that the way I've seen it is we've just kind of bolted on some extra funds saying, hey, people want ESG, socially responsible funds. And so let's throw a few extra ones in there so people have some choices. Okay. So for the people that want to do it themselves... Uh, they can go in and say, hey, I'm really passionate about this, so I'm going to go ahead and choose those funds. Now, they, they've passed our due diligence and our investment screens and gone through the same process as all the other funds. But I kind of, I, you know, not to put you on the spot, but I'm, I'm hearing you say, hey, you can have an ESG fund in, in a, you know, a large cap spot all by itself. And that's the one you offer to the entire population. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, would I, if, if I were sitting in a consultant's role, would I think that that's a prudent decision ultimately? No, because from an asset allocation perspective, I believe in modern portfolio theory and I believe not, okay. you know, if, if I have client or investors or participants who are going to invest according to most likely their values are driving them to ESG at this case, or at this stage. Therefore, if they move all the retirement assets into an all equity option, for example, I don't think that would be a prudent decision for anybody. You know, that's why I think, you know, target date funds, for example, have done well or having a balanced option um, or employing um, multiple or, you know, menu choices where you have multiple options so that they might be able to do their own asset allocation between at least a core intermediate and an, an all equity. ESG. Well, that, that's that. No, that's a great point because that's kind of my next question. So from a behavioral finance standpoint, can we get overwhelmed by having like almost like two sub lineups? Like we have our normal lineup that we've been using for, you know, decades, you know, with your basic blocking and tackling mutual funds. And then here we have all these additional exciting ESG funds that we could add on as well. Do we end up like overwhelming people by having too many choices? You know, I think, I think all human beings get overwhelmed by too many choices, right? I mean, right. what is the, what is the perfect number? I, you know, I, I can't answer that, um, but I think education is a critical component to to really unlocking their ability to make those decisions. 
So ensuring that that educational element is there in place, whether it's self-served, you know, they can click on it, read it, video, et cetera, um, or listen, um, or something that, you know, you conduct a webinar to, to the group, but a combination thereof most likely is, is most effective to help them with those choices. It's a fascinating discussion because, you know, I think it, there's a trend from a consultant standpoint and, and we're consulting our, our clients to narr- narrow down the menu and try to streamline things from a behavioral finance standpoint. But at the same time, we have this explosion of, of options. And so you have to be kind of savvy, I think, both as a consultant and a plan sponsor to kind of construct a menu that doesn't you know, overwhelm someone that wants to you know, invest in ESG at the same time, you want to make sure you're taking care of, uh, you know, your employees overall from a fiduciary perspective. And I think we can create a win-win. I, I firmly agree. Absolutely. Well, that's great. So, uh, you know, Megan, thank you so much. I want to bring you back for a third segment because there's a lot, you know, with anything that, you know, has a lot of uh, popularity around it and a lot of you know questions and it's, it's newer uh, in some respects. Um, there's going to be government regulation. There's going to be the government weighing in from a regulatory perspective. And that's something that all plan sponsors uh, have to take into consideration. So, but I uh, want to thank you so much for being here uh, today. And we're looking forward to talking more about what plan sponsors need to consider from my from a government re- regulation standpoint when putting ESG funds in their plans. So thanks again, Megan. Thanks for having me. That's going to do it for this week's show. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy our show, We'd love for you to subscribe on iTunes or wherever you access your podcasts. The opinions voiced in this program are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. To determine which investments may be appropriate for you, consult with your attorney, accountant, financial or tax advisor prior to investing. Securities offered through LPL Financial, member FINRA and SIPC. Investment advice offered through Global Retirement Partners, LLC, a registered investment advisor. Global Retirement Partners, Washington Financial Group, a division of Hub International Mid-Atlantic and Hub International are not affiliated with LPL Financial. Global Retirement Partners, LPL Financial, Washington Financial Group, and Hub International are not affiliated in any way with the services offered by any guest on this show. Hopefully that, uh, hopefully Jeff can edit that, right?